This is the Fuji X-T4, and on paper it's probably the perfect camera, but today we're going to evaluate its execution to see if that impeccable spec sheet pays off. Let's get undone. What's happening everybody? I'm Gerald Undone, and when nothing goes right, go left. So I've had this camera for about two weeks now, which was lent to me by Fuji. This is a pre-production model, and they obviously expect to have it back. I've not been compensated for this video, and Fuji does not get to review it before I publish it. So I really liked the X-T3, but I don't use one in my regular workflow because as good as it was, it was missing a couple things that made it less than ideal for my needs. And I'm not someone who will just accept a lackluster battery, for example, because of Fuji colors. But when I heard all about the improvements they made to the X-T4, I was convinced they'd made the perfect camera. Now when I say the perfect camera, I don't actually mean perfect, because some things are subjective, and other aspects will always be prone to limitations, like how do you define perfect resolution, for example. So I think instead we should evaluate the features with three designations in mind. It can be worse than the competition, as good as the competition, or better than the competition. And for me, the perfect camera would have all of the key features be as good or better than the competition where it counts. And we're launching off here from the X-T3 and assuming that you have some knowledge of previous Fuji cameras. I can save you some time and tell you that if you didn't like the X-T3 for more reasons than the lack of front-facing screen or IBIS, you're probably not going to like the X-T4 either. And if you dislike Fuji in general because of the images they produce, the lenses, or the vintage looks and top dials, again, this camera probably isn't going to win you over. But if instead you liked the idea of the previous offerings, but just wanted a little bit more, then this might be the camera for you. So let's begin with the ergonomics and menus. First off, I don't like the top dials or the vintage looks, but thankfully that doesn't preclude me from being able to use this camera successfully. I usually just set them all to their respective control modes and then just adjust my exposure with the more modern thumb and command dials. That was the same with the X-T3, but this version is better because they've given us a better placed and correctly assigned AF on button and better access to the quick menu, and the grip is deeper and more useful for large hands compared to the X-T3. It has a flip out screen, which is obviously infinitely better for seeing yourself than not having one, and there's enough assignable function buttons to get by. For this section, I'd say the Fuji X-T4 is as good as the competition. It's not the best or better than the competition, because the top dials are a waste of real estate in my opinion, which could be better used for some more function buttons or a third command dial, and the grip isn't the best in the business when compared to Panasonic, Nikon, or some Canons. And to be honest, I don't think the flip out screen is the best way to go. I think you either need some super multi version like the Panasonic S1H, where it can three way tilt and flip out, or just do what Sony's doing and have a flip up screen. I actually like the flip up screens better because you can keep your view directly behind the lens while getting high and low angles, and then when self filming, you aren't looking off to the side. So everything Fuji's done here is great and an improvement for sure, but it's not the best I've seen. But that won't hurt it from being the perfect camera, because remember, it only has to be as good or better not the best in everything. But this brings me to the first area where it's worse than the competition. In fact, it's worse than even the X-T3, which is the input and output ports. First, they did away with the X-T3's removable port door, which I thought was an awesome feature, and instead went the flap method. Flaps suck. You don't want things dangling, blocking your access. And they also ditched the headphone jack while keeping micro HDMI which is unfortunate. Now they did include the dongle that lets you use your USB-C port as a headphone jack, which is appreciated because it really bothered me on the X-T30 that they wanted you to do the same thing, but then they didn't include one in the box. And the one from my Google Pixel didn't work. So I appreciate this inclusion, but that means you can't use USB power delivery and headphones at the same time, which is silly and not quite as good as the competition. Unless you buy the grip. Now I wasn't a fan of the X-H1's reliance on the grip, and thankfully this camera doesn't require the grip to fully function, but it does give you a headphone jack and frees up the USB-C port to allow you to charge all three batteries in that case at once, the one in the camera and the two in the grip. And this grip does offer a better value than previous Fuji grips because this one actually includes the two extra batteries when you buy it, making it a decent investment because these new batteries are great. They've nearly doubled their capacity and are now pretty much on par with Sony's FZ100 batteries, which for me is the most important improvement on the list. I hated the old Fuji batteries. And while these new ones aren't the best in the business, they're definitely as good as the competition and good enough to keep me happy. Speaking of that removable door though, on the port side, they've put that removable door on the memory card side now, which doesn't make much sense to me, but there are some improvements in general on the memory card side. You're still getting dual UHS-2 SD card slots, but now you can open the door and hot swap them without the camera turning off and stopping recording. And you can also do backup recording and video, so you can write your video 
file simultaneously to both slots if you're worried about data loss. This now puts Fuji on par with the competition in this regard. But there's one perplexing element to this. You can hot swap cards, yes, but it still has the same record limits on the camera, so what's the point? You can still only record 30 minutes in 24, 25, or 30 frames per second, and 20 minutes in 4K 50 or 60. So unless you're using really small SD cards, I don't see hot swapping being necessary. And this is a notable area where for me, the Fuji is not as good as the competition. Sony's recently made the move to no record limits, and Panasonic's been doing it for quite a while now. However, credit where credit's due, that's pretty much the only limitation in terms of settings and recording control. I can't speak to whether you'll personally like the navigation of Fuji's menus, but what I can say is that everything is there. I heavily praise the X-T3 for being able to customize so much about your recording. You can separate your profile so you can send F-log to the SD card and a film simulation to the external recorder, or vice versa. You can set one to 4K and one to 1080p. You've got all I, long GOP, H.264, H.265, multiple bitrate options, 10-bit color, separate settings for photo and video, separate settings for the internal mic or the external mic, multiple tally light controls. It's just outstanding. And now they've included a dedicated selector switch to get you quickly between photo and video modes with customized menus for each interface. They've also added F-log view assist and a new thing called fix movie crop magnification, which lets you apply the same crop to all your recordings so it doesn't change when you jump from 4K 60 to 4K 24 or to the slow motion modes or when using digital IS. This way you can keep the same framing throughout. And I also like how when you do activate a mode that has a different crop, it displays it for you in the top corner of the LCD so you don't have to guess at it. it makes my job easier too when I want to share the different crop specs with you guys which I might as well do now. So up to 4K30 with just regular IBIS, you get your standard 1.5 times APS-C Fuji crop. If you enable digital IS, you'll get an additional 1.1 times crop. If you shoot in 4K50 or 60, you'll get a 1.18 times crop. And if you shoot in 4K50 or 60 with digital IS, the crops combine into an additional 1.29 times. You'll also get the additional 1.29 times if you use the 120p or 240p slow motion modes. And something else I like about this camera is when using any of those different frame rate options, you can set your shutter speed to exactly double for the 180 degree rule. So rather than 1 50th of a second, you can use 1 48th. And rather than 1 2 50th, you can set it to 1 2 40th, etc. That's a much appreciated inclusion. I also like all the information that's displayed when reviewing a video clip that you recorded in camera. It shows you the exposure settings, white balance, profile, resolution, and frame rate of the clip that you captured, which is really handy when you want to recreate a similar shot, and not a lot of other cameras do this for video. So overall, when it comes to menus and customization, Fuji gets the nod for being better than most of the competition. Things are pretty easy to find, and pretty much everything that you'd want to find is in there. I do have a couple notes for improvement though. First, it'd be nice to see some more video monitoring tools like waveforms. And second, there's this strange behavior where the menu will remember your position if you exit it and return to it, unless you're in the setup page. It seems to forget your position when you exit from the setup tab, which feels like an incorrect behavior. Anyway, that pretty much covers my experience physically using the camera. And so far, nothing that would stop it from being the perfect camera, save for maybe the record time limits. But those can be bypassed by using an external recorder, which works wonderfully on the X-T4, thanks again to all those excellent menu and output optimizations. But now let's talk about the actual results you get, and for this I'm going to enlist the help of someone whose entire existence is dedicated to this perfect camera pursuit. Oh hey Gerald, is that the X-T4? What? Alright, so we're here with Camera Conspiracies, and you had a chance to play a little bit with the Fuji X-T4, and we did a couple things based on your needs for the perfect camera, which are what? IBIS? Run focus. Shouldn't you point that at you? Autofocus. Super slow motion, so I can cross the street, inspiring people <laughs> across the nation. And color science matters because I suck at color grading. I don't want to fiddle around. So let's talk about the IBIS. We did Sony A6400 on a gimbal. That would be, I guess, maybe our control. That's, that's a camera with no IBIS and it's stable. And then we did the A6600, which has IBIS built in, and you were just holding it on like a little Manfrotto Pixie. And then we did the Fuji X-T4 with, it has two IBIS settings. It's got regular IBIS, if you will, and then digital image stabilization. And we did both of those. And then you also did your G85, which you think is like, that's your best. That's the best I've seen in a camera. It's comparable to a gimbal. Better sometimes. And what, what are your findings? Basically, we found the gimbal was the best. A6400 with a gimbal, smoothest footage you could get. Second place, very close, was the Panasonic G85, which cost like $200 now. 
then came we kind of we didn't butt heads on this but fuji ibis plus digital looked the most pleasing so there was things happening sometimes the face would just like jump and you were saying there was like some blowfish face that i was face was like (laughs) was like squeezing in and out a little bit i mean i'm gonna put the clips up while we're talking about this so they might be able to see it but i couldn't see that but it was not free of like artifacts and weird and then when we take the digital off the weirdness was gone but we had a lot more bounces digital off felt more natural but it was more shaky and to be fair we didn't test any fuji lens with stabilization in the lens which might have just fixed everything but i doubt it though i think the lenses that we did test we used the we got the 16 to 55 f2.8 and we have the 23 f2 and there's a chart with the lenses and these ones are getting like five and a half or six stops according to that chart so they should be as good as what panasonic is saying in terms of stops but the stops thing is more relative for photography and i imagine the ibis works great for getting a low shutter speed photos but in terms of street walking stabilization it's it's not the kind of six stops you get over there is, is the point. It's the walking that Fuji just can't handle. Like if you're just holding it, it looks pretty good until you start moving, which all cameras suffer with. They struggle with, but Panasonic somehow. And Olympus is even better than Panasonic. Wow. But it is better than the Sony. It's tough to watch. Like it's really, really shaky and really bad. It's better than when it's off. Is it though? <laughs> From what I've tested, I'm not impressed. And that's what I was waiting for. Can Fuji do it? The X-H1 wasn't good enough. I can say that it's better than the X-H1 if you're just doing this. Like if you're handheld shooting something and you're kind of making like slow movements like that, it is better than the X-H1. So that's not, but for vlogging, I guess, would be the question here. Your perfect vlogging camera, the IBIS isn't a huge improvement and it's not Panasonic level. There's there's a mode, the IS Boost, just like Panasonic has their IS Boost, right? And when you put the IS Boost on, on Panasonic, it all of a sudden looks like you're on a tripod. It like, you know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. It just locks it right off. Fuji has that as well. And I don't know if it's just because this is a pre-production model, but it doesn't do anything. Let's move on. So IBIS, it's an improvement, but it's not Panasonic level. Autofocus. It locks on well. It, if you want to jump in and out of frame like a jackass, which you would never do, it, it skips, it pulses. I feel like it's a mix between Panasonic and Sony. It, it was nowhere near the Sony autofocus. In here, it performed pretty well. It's not great. If you just po- need it to point at yourself and keep your face in focus, I, I think it'll do that no problem. And pretty much every mode has eye AF in video. Mm-hmm. We put it up to, I think we even had it at the 240 frames per second thing. My problem is that the focus is too fast in every other application. We were doing some tests where, like you said, the jump in and jump out test. Mm-hmm. That one, if you watch the trees in the background, they like freak out. They like flash from in and out of focus and it makes it jarring. It doesn't have a way to transition smoothly. And then just before we shot this, we were we were messing around in here. We were just pointing it at things, and we were changing all the settings: speed, fast and slow, and the responsive fast or like locked on. And it's the same thing. You point it at one thing, and it kind of like blinks to it. And then you point it at something else, and it's like you were pointing over here, and you're like, "That's four jumps and two yeah. jumps." I pointed at the mouse, and it jumped four times before it got the focus. And I think the main problem with Fuji is the lenses. They just that's their problem. It's like the stepping autofocus. They haven't fixed it. They have a couple. Like, I think the new 16mm f2.8 is like, okay, we make video now. Let's make some video lenses that are smooth. Yeah, because Sony has the, whatever they call them, XD linears. And they, like, basically, like, they slide. The motor, like, slides forward and back. And you can see that when we compared it to the same jump in, jump out with the Sony. The trees do go in and out of focus, but they kind of, like, slide in and out of focus. And it doesn't make you look at them in a way that would be displeasing because this is supposed to have a more improved autofocus system and i think what that means is it's just so fast now like it's the craziest fastest thing i've ever seen but that's not great for video transitions but for photography sure if you need to like snap focus as like somebody's running at you but if you want video transitions uh i don't think this is on for that but it is fast so if that's what you're looking for, where you want it to just like, if you jump, if you do this and jump in the frame and you want to just like to snap to your face, it does that. So again, I think for vlogging, it's good. I was doing some weird things when we were both in the shot. It would focus on you, even though I'm closer to the camera. 
it was doing some weird things and in the slow motion test when i turned my head away from the camera it lost me for a second that was interesting it almost looked like it was trying to show what you were looking at it, cinematic it, it worked out well but it was weird that it did that but yeah on paper it's the best in practice it's not that impressive sony autofocus is much better panasonic has much better stabilization it's a jack of all trades master of nothing but color science they mastered that and exposure is nice it's not the perfect camera i was hoping to disappear to disintegrate it didn't happen i'm still here something the fuji really has going for it though that makes those handheld camera movements and vlogging shots easier to look at than using aps-c sony's is its excellent rolling shutter performance so while it might not be quite as good as the competition in terms of autofocus or image stabilization it does have probably the best sensor readout at its price point you're not going to see much jello here and that sensor also scores well in terms of color accuracy and dynamic range it's obviously not as good as some of the full frame competition from sony but it definitely keeps up with the latest aps-c offering from the competition. There's nothing stopping you from producing high quality photos and videos with this camera. And we didn't really talk about photography at all, and that's because for the most part it shares the same capabilities as the last few Fuji cameras. The X-T3, X-T30, X-Pro3, and X-100V are all using the same sensor and processor and are capable of taking essentially the same images. Yeah, there's a couple new film simulations, and the X-T4 is the fastest of the lot. It can fire off to 15 frames per second using the mechanical shutter, and it's even quieter than the previous version. So if you like the previous Fujis for photography, you'll probably like this one 5-10% to more. Although the new battery is very handy to have, and so is the IBIS if you could take advantage of slow shutter handheld shots. But in conclusion, is it the perfect camera? No. It doesn't quite have the IBIS or the autofocus performance to get that title. But the camera is definitely better off having those features in the state they're in versus not having them at all. And maybe they'll be improved in the future with firmware. But their inclusions, mixed with the great new battery, the excellent menu and customization options, the articulating screen, and the other quality of life improvements, make this the closest Fuji has come to being the perfect camera. In fact, it might be the closest anyone has come in this price range. Because in almost every other category, it's either as good as the competition, or better. So if we can revise what Casey said in his conclusion, I'd instead say, the Fuji X-T4 is more a jack of all trades, master of some. Oh, hey, Gerald. Is that the XP4? <laughs> oh, hey, Gerald. Is that the, this the... Is that the XP4? Why? Is that the XP4? Oh, 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 hey, Gerald. Is that the XP4? Oh, my God. But that's going to be it for me. I hope you found this video entertaining, or at least helpful. And if you did, make sure you leave it the old thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. But if you did not find this video helpful or entertaining, then your life is probably a film simulation. All right, I'm done.